welcome to the service this morning. I don't know about you guys, but I'm really excited and happy today to be meeting with you in real life. All right? I was thinking last night of two years ago when the lockdowns happened and then we got back together again and then shortly after that last year again we were all stuck into lockdown yet again and how it was like meeting behind our screens. I mean, even as the media guy in the church, I was always watching church on a Sunday morning going, am I watching the right service? Is this this week? I can't remember what week I'm actually supposed to be on. And then obviously we live in South Africa, so you go, am I gonna have enough data to get to the end of this message? And with Ishcom playing its latest tricks, will my battery last until the end of this sermon? So it was definitely a different experience a few years or two years ago and last year meeting online so this morning that's one of the things we're going to be looking at because this morning we're launching a new digital series looking at the digital church and media and everything else to do with living a Christian life in the modern age and in the age of cyberspace and everything else so to get started today we're going to be looking at the things that we've all had to adapt to over the last two years and that's virtual church and online church and digital church and everything else. But more specifically than that, we're not just going to be looking at virtual church and online church. We're going to be looking at a new thing that's come out of virtual church and online church. And that is e-Christianity. But before we get there, let's look into what virtual church actually is. All right. After all, when I say virtual church... You're probably thinking, sitting and watching a service on YouTube. That's virtual church. That's what it's all about, right? Um, it's actually not, because there's two different versions of virtual church. And how we distinguish them is online church and virtual church. Okay, you might know where I'm going with this if you've seen any of it on the news lately. But there's two different things. As Ramsey Baptist Church, we do online church. So as you can see, break the fourth wall, we're recording the sermon today so that this sermon will get uploaded to our social media and to our YouTube platform and on Spotify and everything else. And that's our version of online church. All right. We don't do anything online that doesn't happen simultaneously with a physical service that we all get together to and we just set a camera up and we record. All our online content is done in addition to those physical services and part of those physical services. They're an extension of our physical services and the physical ministry that we're doing as a church. Regardless of whether it is an online recording of a sermon or a message that we send out on WhatsApp or the latest sermon on Spotify. All of that stems from our physical interactions together as a church. And that's our version of online church. Today, that's what most churches do in terms of an online space. Most churches will have a YouTube channel, a Facebook page, Spotify, if they really don't have much standards, Apple Music, you know, stuff like that. However, that's where online church ends. It's the videos and the podcasts and everything else, but that's the end of online church. But starting in 2016 already, We've seen the birth of a new type of online church, and that's virtual church. So let me ask you a question today. Who of you here have heard about the metaverse? Put your hand up if you know what the metaverse is, or you've heard about the metaverse. Right? If you have heard about it, you probably know a little bit about what I'm going to be speaking about. If you haven't heard about it, let me try and briefly explain this very confusing concept that humans have created. All right, the metaverse is a virtual reality universe. So for those of us who are a little bit older, we used to call it cyberspace, all right? Oh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> cyberspace. We always used to get told when we were younger, it's in cyberspace, all right? It was this whole amazing place that we couldn't access, but we knew was there. Today, that is the metaverse, all right? It's an entire universe created online that's stored in a server somewhere, and it's no longer just cyberspace. It's a whole world that you can access using virtual reality equipment, or headsets, or your laptop, or anything else. You can log online and you can walk around in a digitally recreated world. 
There's fields and there's trees and there's wind and there's birds and there's sunsets. There's buildings, there's shops. MTN has just launched a store in the metaverse here from South Africa. All the things that you can expect to find in the real world. I saw a cow yesterday. Do you know how excited I got? I was walking around in the virtual world and I saw a cow and I was like, this is amazing, there's a cow. <laughs> all right. So all the things you expect to find in the normal world are now being made in the digital world and in the metaverse. One of those things is churches. There's now virtual churches. Two of the main ones is VR Church that was launched in 2016. It was the first virtual reality church. Okay, it's now a massive church. The second biggest one is I don't know if anyone knows about Life Church. It's a massive church in the States, pastored by Craig Grishol. They've got 39 physical locations and they're now the biggest virtual church, second to VR Church, and that's only because they started later. There's also many others. For instance, Church on the Rock. I took a picture of it yesterday. They had a service this morning at 2.45 a.m., which obviously for them is normal local time. Sadly, I didn't attend this because I was attending virtual sleep. <laughs> so I was having my dreams while they were having church. But surprisingly, with these two massive churches and all the other smaller ones, there's no actual published statistics of how many people are attending these churches. But they do say that virtual VR church, back in 2016 when it first launched, had 90 people attend its very first service, which is a big amount, considering virtual reality in 2016 was nothing compared to what it is today. In fact, in 2016, Virtual reality as an industry was only valued at around $2 billion, somewhere around that, and that's worldwide. Today, as it stands, it's valued at $4.8 billion, with most economists estimating that the industry is going to grow to $12.1 billion by 2024, in just two years' time. Because virtual reality is becoming more accessible. It's becoming mainstream. More people are getting access to it. Further proof that people are logging onto the virtual space is yesterday, when I was walking around, there's people searching for spiritual purposes. Last night, for about 10 minutes, I logged online. There was a virtual world for religious debate. Um, Alvin, you can skip ahead the slide, sorry, to that video, just to show you what it looks like. So this was an area where people log online for virtual debate about spiritual matters. So everyone from every different religion comes together and they discuss the different points of their religion. So this guy busy talking at the moment was busy speaking about Christianity. I don't know exactly because the guy he was speaking to didn't physically say, but he was speaking from the point of a Muslim person. And this is the universe that we get put into to have these discussions. I was only there for 10 minutes. I joined pretty much as they started. And there were already 22 people in this world with me. So there are definitely people logging online into virtual reality worlds to have discussions about faith and to have discussions about spiritual purposes. Now, both VR church and online church have some really good benefits to them. For online church, it's the reasons we as RBC do it, okay? Because the reasons are simple. If you're new in the area and you're looking for a church, what better way to experience what the church is like by going online and seeing what it's all about before you even step a toe in the door. That way, if we are a bunch of weirdos, you can dodge a bullet. You don't need to come here and be harassed by us. Just check online, see how weird we are and realize if it's the level of weirdness you're comfortable with and where you are, or if it's a little bit too far out there for you. So it helps new people looking for a new church if they've moved into the area, especially when it comes to youth. Because let me tell you, there is nothing more terrifying, and I can say this as a past youth, there's nothing more terrifying than walking into this church as a new youth and seeing amplified youth. You immediately just go, the Lord does help people. <laughs> all right. But it helps all of us in the church as well catch up. If we miss a service because we have to work or we're away on holiday, or we're busy in the, part, in the sermon series and we can't make it for a reason because maybe we're sick. 
then logging online and just watching the sermon quickly helps us catch up within the church. If we've missed notes in the sermon, because I'm speaking too fast, which I know I do. So if you miss notes, because my slides already gone by the time you try and write it down, you can log online and watch it again and take notes. I like to listen to the sermon again in my car while driving to work on Spotify because you hear things the second time you didn't hear the first time. It allows people who are sick or else can't come to church to still experience church and still hear the word of God. I love the fact that we have online church because my mother's not able to go to church. She's too sick. But every single Sunday she logs online and she still watches church. So it's amazing that she has the ability to still hear the word of God, even though she's too sick. It helps people who are out there and searching get answers. They might not be Christians, but if they're searching a question that they may have about God, and our sermon pops up, you never know. That sermon may lead them to Christ. And it's a sermon from three years ago. See, we're being productive even when we don't know it. So I love online church. And for virtual reality, there's even more reasons to love it. Because you can reach people that otherwise you may never have reached, ever. Because they're going into this virtual world to try and live their lives. You'll see a little bit later on, you can recreate iconic biblical moments in this immersive experience that you get to actually experience what you read about in the Bible. You can interact more while doing online church than simply looking at a screen and watching a pre-recorded message. Instead, you can interact with the people. Some of the things I did yesterday, because like I said, I was running around because I can't come tell you about virtual reality church if I haven't done it. So one of the things I did was I went on a tour of the Sea of Galilee. So you go into the world, and that's the map you get at the start. So it tells you, there's the sea, you are here, I was there. Um, and it tells you all the different big biblical events that happened around the Sea of Galilee. And you simply click on one of the things, the fast travel shortcuts or whatever they call it, or you can walk there, which takes forever, 10 out of 10, do not recommend. All right. And I went to the Sermon on the Mount, and I watched Jesus talking to people. Then I went and watched Jesus walking on water. Okay, and it's very cool. It has the Bible verses of the event floating next to it. After that, I went to go watch Jesus feeding the 5,000. And this was really cool because you could walk up to Jesus and you can take a loaf of bread or a fish out of his hand. And as you do that, a new one appears. Wow. So it's really cool. And then I met this guy while I was there. This is actually a pastor from Texas. And him and I spoke for about 15 minutes. Because he's now also discovering VR Church. And he's also getting people or looking at how viable it is for their church to go into the metaverse. And it was quite an interesting conversation with him, but I'm not going to get into that now because Allah's going to be preaching about virtual reality church for the rest of the time. And that's not actually what we're about. This is just one of the platforms. So it's very interesting to see what's out there and the way church is evolving. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to convince you to stop coming to church and go on to VR church. It has its place, don't get me wrong. It's pretty cool. I didn't get a picture of it. I went on the ark, I'm just saying, while it was raining. Okay, I did that late last night. So it's really amazing being able to relive these biblical experiences on your screen or in this immersive environment. But the problem is virtual church and online church and all these amazing platforms that bring so many new things to our faith are churning out e-Christians, which is what I actually want to speak about today. They're churning out e-Christians, which we may never have even heard of before. Okay, because e-Christianity is a new form or way of being a Christian. It's a person that in the metaverse or online is like the epitome of what we want to be as Christians. Okay? We see them online and we're like, oh, I wish I could be as good a Christian as that person. I mean, they have it down. There's no contest for them. They don't struggle with temptation. What's that? They are just walking hand in hand with the Lord. 
And then we look at our lives and we go, oh, okay. They're caring, they're loving, they watch their speech, they love everybody, as the Bible tells us to do. Even the drivers that cut them off in traffic, they're just like, I love you. <laughs> when they're not in the virtual world, in the metaverse, they're posting every status you can think of on WhatsApp, sharing the love of God, sharing their favorite Bible verse, sharing a new praise and worship song, talking about how amazing it is to be a child of the Creator. They are the literal hype men of Christianity. Yeah, if you're a youth, you know what that means. If you're older, I'm sorry. Okay? They hype up Christianity for people who don't even know what Christianity is. They make people want to be excited for Christianity. The way we're all called to be. And then you see them offline. And things change very drastically. The story is no longer the same. They may be posting that they love their neighbor like Jesus did, but in reality they're fighting with their own family almost every single day. They no longer watch what they say. On statuses it's always pure speech. Watch your tongue, control your tongue. But, but in reality when they're talking amongst their friends, that's not what they're doing. They may drink, they may smoke, they may do a whole lot of different things. Their lives are actually full of sin, but online, online their profile is squeaky. See, one good likeness is the whitewashed tombs of the Pharisees in the Bible. On the outside, they're amazing. Everything appears pristine and clean and the way it should be. I mean, you can go to the cemetery today and you see these amazing tombstones made of granite and they're engraved and they're cut a certain way and there's flowers and everything but on the inside it's something very different all that there is on the inside is death 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 describes them best it says they will appear to have a godly life but they will not let its power change them stay away from such people see they will appear to have a godly life but nothing's changed in their life from before they were Christians. They appear to be walking with the Lord, but in reality they're not even in the same metaverse as Him. And yet they're claiming to be. And you know, there's ways that we can identify them. There's four ways we can identify you Christians. The first way is that they sus subscribe online only. They subscribe to online pastors and channels and services, but never to a local church. If you speak to any e-Christian, they'll easily be able to tell you what the latest praise and worship is. They'll tell you what you should be listening to, what channels to watch to get the best sermons. They'll tell you what websites to go to for the best resources. They might even be able to tell you where to go in the metaverse to get the best virtual tour of biblical events. They know all of this. They like, they comment, they share, and they subscribe to all these channels, all these pastors and ministries, and these online personalities. But they actually have serious commitment issues. Because they're subscribing left, right, and center, but they won't subscribe to a local church and to a local pastor. They prefer to give their loyalty to an online avatar somewhere. Or a brand that a physical church, and uh, rather, sorry, than a brand or physical church down the road. A pastor down the road who's busy preaching. And there's a simple reason. Because if they don't like what they're hearing online, they simply unsubscribe and find someone new to subscribe to. It's that simple. Which leads us to the next way we can identify them. Which is they move where they're comfortable. Okay, I was once told that for a message to really hit home, this is what I was told in school, for a message to really hit home, it needs to make you uncomfortable. That's how you know you've heard a good message from the Bible. For a message to really hit home, it needs to make you uncomfortable. You need to be sitting there going, Pastor, stop looking at me. Look at the other people in the church as well. Meanwhile, the pastor hasn't glanced in your direction once. Okay, I'm not entirely sure this is accurate 
Because yes, God should convict us, but it shouldn't make us uncomfortable being called out by God. Because we should be living the way God expects us to live in the first place. I understand what the person was trying to say to me though. We're living in a time where godly things and godly values are becoming more and more opposed by the world because they don't fit into the world anymore. For that simple reason, living the way we're expected to live according to God offends somebody out there in the world. Everyone is offended by something nowadays. No matter who you are or where you go, someone is offended by someone. Whether it's someone who's decided to identify as a pot plant for the day or somebody who's chosen to declare themselves a saint and get your money for no reason. There's someone that will always be offended by you. And if you're living the way God wants you to live, you're going to be offending people today. Well done. Go and offend them. Don't tell pastor I said that. But you see, God uses messages in churches to make us slightly uncomfortable. He uses us, uses it, so that the Holy Spirit can convict us of things we may not even realize is in our lives, that we should be paying attention to. If a message makes you uncomfortable, it's hitting too close to home. <coughs> if a message makes you uncomfortable, you need to ask why are you uncomfortable? See, because that uncomfortableness is how God directs us and teaches us and leads us to the way that we're supposed to be living for Him. No one likes being uncomfortable, right? No one likes situations of where you're not really sure what to do or where to go or anything else. But for e-Christians, it's worse than it is for us. Because they are literally pulled from their comfort zone. <laughs> because they have less of a comfort zone to be in than we do if we know we're living right. But you see, the problem with e-Christianity is it's all about comfort. That's what the whole thing is based on. It's comfort. Do church where you're comfortable. You guys don't understand how lucky you are that I'm here today and not on the couch in my underwear zooming onto the screen and giving you the message. I mean, it was cold this morning. I didn't want to get up and come here. See, that's what e-Christianity is. It's about doing church where you're comfortable. Sit in your underwear on the, church, on the couch, you know. Just get into virtual reality where you've got full clothes on and then go about your life. Go about your day. Go to church. It's about making us comfortable when that's not what living for God is about. Living for God is about getting uncomfortable and seeing the things in your life that you should be changing so that you can walk even closer with God. E-Christianity does not do that. And what do E-Christians do? They move when they're uncomfortable. If a pastor says something they don't like, unsubscribe, Google search, ooh, new channel, subscribe. Yeah? They jump from one virtual church to another. Like, ha, different pastor, no one knows me here. No one knows you anyway, it's a virtual church. Everyone only knows that you're known as Shaq 74 ZA. I mean, really. See, the next way to identify these Christians is that they are active on social media, but not in their faith. Their faith is only online. They will post 400 plus statuses about Jehovah Jireh and God is my provider. But then when it actually comes to trusting God for provision, they scramble because they don't trust God to get them through it. They will go to the banks and get loans and get credit cards and get credit cards for their credit cards so that they can pay off their credit cards because they don't trust God to survive or to provide. And yet online, oh, let me tell you, they can teach you 74 financial lessons about God's provision, okay? So they never put their faith into action. On social media, they display all the faith that we wish we could have. Like, why can't I have faith like that? Why can't I walk on water? You can in the VR universe, I'm just saying. But they make you feel bad sometimes because you're like, why don't I have that faith? Why can't I trust God like that? The reality is they don't even trust God like that. They're living in cloud cuckoo land and they're deceiving themselves and you into thinking that they trust God. On social media, they're sharing sermon about sermon after sermon about godly living. Not sleeping around before marriage. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Respect your parents. Okay? All the other principles we know we should be living by. You see them in real life. Oh boy. Okay, things are not the same. They posted half an hour ago, but you see them leaving somewhere with a stranger they've just met. And you go, okay, sure. 
You pass them on the street carrying their tops bag. <laughs> and you're like, okay, things are about to get lit. They deceive themselves into thinking that they're Christians, and they deceive others into thinking they are as well. In reality, they're, speaking, they're doing exactly what 2 Timothy spoke about. They appear to be living a godly life, testifying to people, sharing God's love, constantly talking about God. But they even haven't even allowed the Holy Spirit to change them. But they're telling you that it must change you. So they're active, but they're not active. It's the least active people you've ever seen, even though they look the busiest. It's like me at work. I'm constantly looking busy, but I'm actually doing nothing. <laughs> the fourth way to identify Christians is that they distort messages given by pastors and they make mockeries of pastors' messages, or they simply find pastors to agree with them. They find what's convenient. Because let's be honest, there's a lot of weird and wonderful teachings out there today. There's a lot of weird and wonderful teachings out there today. All right, things that you can tap into from the one thing I saw, I want to lie to you, the one thing I saw was that God lives within each of us, but he is still God. But we can tap into God within each of us to become a God, but he is still God. I don't know how it worked. I gave up after like half an hour. I was like, this doesn't make any sense to me. I was just like, I don't have time for all mental capacity for this. They were talking about rest. I needed rest after that. <laughs> Then you have the more controversial things, LGBTQI+, drinking and passing out everywhere, sleeping around with anything that moves. All the sins that are becoming commonplace today in the world are all now controversial topics in the church. It's not controversial. The Bible's clear. But these e-Christians distort the messages. A pastor will preach a message and they'll go, that's not what he meant. He didn't mean it like that. This is what he actually meant. And the problem is these e-Christians, where are they getting it? They're getting it from e-pastors who have never studied to be a pastor, probably don't even really know the Lord, and yet they have a YouTube channel doing teachings on God's Word. They deceive hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And quite simply, it's because E-Christians don't have the discernment to realize what's true and what's fake because they're not actually living with God. They've never been exposed to doctrinally, doctrinally, yeah, sound teachings so that when something comes along, they don't know whether it's true or whether it's false. Sadly, the main reason for this is they don't want to hear that they're wrong. They live out what it says in 2 Timothy 4 verse 3. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to, te to say what their itching ears want to find out. Which is exactly what's happening with e-Christians. <laughs> you didn't scratch my ear today. Bye-bye. Unsubscribe. Find someone new. They just move constantly depending on what they want to hear. Not what's actually doctrinally sound. Not according to what's true in God's word. Just, it didn't make me feel good. Bye. And then they change their avatar and go somewhere else. <laughs> just a few clicks, done. So you see, e-Christians are a whole new breed of people. And what are they doing? They're deceiving people into thinking they're following the Lord. They're deceiving Christians into thinking they're following the Lord. They're deceiving themselves into thinking they're following the Lord. And that's the sad part, is that they believe it. But luckily there is a test to true Christianity. There is a test to see, are you an e-Christian or are you a true Christian? Because I'm a true Christian, but I still went in VR church. Just to see what it's about. It was interesting. I got to see the ark. But you see, there's a difference in how you use the platforms. There's a difference in how you portray yourself as an e-Christian. For one thing, online and virtual church should be a supplement to your local church, not a substitute to your local church. Okay, let me say that again. It should be a supplement to your local church, not a substitute for your local church. 
It's there when you really can't make it to church, okay? When you're sick and you feel like you're dying and you're actually about to meet Jesus, so you can't get up and go to church, that's when you can watch online church. Or when you have to work or you can't make it to church because you are sick or you can't um, get away from something, that's when you can watch online church. Online and virtual church should be a tool to help you Build your relationship with God. It shouldn't be a replacement for the church, which is helping you build your relationship with God. VR is fantastic. Like I said, it lets you experience all these amazing things that happen in the Bible. Use it as a tool, not as the main message. It's a side, not the main meal. Okay? It's the chips, not the burger. Don't replace it. So that's the first thing. Test if you're a true Christian. Are you using online church as a replacement for church? If you are, yeah. You know that uncomfortable we were talking about? Mm -hmm. The second thing is, live out what you post online. If you're going to post something online, don't post it if you're not going to follow it up with your actual actions in life. Live out what you're posting online. If you post about having faith in God, then you better have faith in God. Show people your faith in God. Don't say, I have faith in God, and then go, oh no. Okay? If you post something, live up to it. If you post that you don't swear, don't swear at the person that cuts you off in traffic. Even in your head. Okay? Don't do it. Because if you're posting that and you're telling other people that you're doing that, then how can you turn around and go and do it? If you say on your status, you don't believe that God called us to get drunk everywhere. Whether Jesus made wine at a wedding or not, we shouldn't get drunk, okay? Don't be seen with bottles in your hand with you lying on the floor and pictures being taken by someone else. It's quite simple. Live out the thing you are, you are portraying that you're living out. Because then you are a true Christian. Then you are not just an e-Christian who's online is fantastic, but in real life doesn't do anything. Because you know what a proper Christian does? They do church. You're all here today. You're doing church. They do life with the Lord. Not just online. I did take a selfie with Jesus yesterday. But further than that, I'm walking with the Lord in my actual life. I don't just post about it and share pictures about it. And make it seem like we're living it up with God. When in reality we're actually hand in hand with Satan. That is what we should be careful of. Because in reality, could you imagine if e-Christianity and VR church became the norm? Could you imagine if we only ever saw one another in avatar form? And we never actually physically saw one another. If pastor only ever preached to us from behind a screen and about things that we're comfortable hearing... Let's be honest, he'd be preaching the same sermon over and over and over again. Because the list of things we're uncomfortable about is like that. And the list of things we're comfortable about, according to God's word, is like that. And if he did preach a message you're uncomfortable with, unsubscribe. New church. I hear Connections has a website. <laughs> it's that simple. Can you imagine replacing our quiet times with God with VR tours? They make things look great, give us an experience that we cannot believe. There's the sound, there's the music. We have to sit with this weird contraption on our face. But it gives us everything, and yet there's no substance to it. So our quiet times are just time wasted. They don't actually help us grow in our relationship with God. Don't teach us what God actually wants us to learn. I like asking myself this. What would happen if Jesus came back today? Would he launch a ministry online? Would he actually have followers considering what he preaches in today's standards? Would people actually follow him? Would they say, yes, let's follow him? <laughs> this is my favorite one. Would he teach his disciples via Zoom meetings? <laughs> Sorry, Lord, I disconnected. Can you repeat that last part? <laughs> Put your camera down. We're looking up your nose. I can't unmute. Would he perform miracles by asking people to touch the screen? And you have a touch screen and you accidentally end the chat, you're like, how? Miracle gone. 
Would he encourage us to meet in online virtual spaces? Or would he encourage us to still meet in his house and in each other's homes? And finally, what would he say about e-Christianity? What would Jesus say about e-Christianity? I don't think he would do any of those things, to be honest. I think he would be horrified that we've established a diversion of devotion to God that is subscribing to God without actually following him. It's subscribing to the idea of God without actually carrying it out. It's becoming part of the church without any of the commitment to a church. It's friendship with one another and with each other's avatars without any of the fellowship that comes with it. It's the idea of liking God and Christianity without living out what we're actually meant to be doing. You know, one of the verses that best sums up God's answer to e-Christianity, the online church, virtual church, everything, is Hebrews 10 verse 25, which we've all heard before. Sorry, I'm getting looks from the back. I know we're over. It says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more since you see that the day of the Lord is coming near. Do not give up the habit of meeting together. All right? And that doesn't mean online. That doesn't mean in a virtual church. That doesn't mean on deck four of the ark. All right? It means in church. It tells us everything we need to know about Christianity. It says that we're to meet together. We shouldn't give up on meeting. Even as the day of the Lord comes near, we should meet more. We should get together more. You know, the lifting of the regulations coming in South Africa now. We don't have to wear a mask. Everyone take a deep breath. It's so nice. You know, the restrictions lifted on the mass people gathering. It couldn't have come in a better time. Because people are getting comfortable staying away from church. People are getting comfortable with online church. And we're just logging on every week and seeing church online. But the lifting of these regulations means we can take e-Christianity and put it to the side. And use it as a tool it's meant to be used as. It means instead we can get together and meet together the way we're meant to. We can live like true Christians the way God intended us to do. By getting together to praise Him, to worship Him, to learn about Him. So if you're watching online, or even if you're a member of RBC, or a visitor, get back to church. Come back to church. We're open. We've been open. We want to experience life together. We want to encourage each other to celebrate Christ and the things He's doing in our lives. I'm not going to share with you via my avatar what God did for me this week. Come to church, I'll tell you. You know, get together, have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee, have a cookie if the youth haven't eaten all of them yet. Okay, but get together, be like Hebrews. For everyone here today, you're already here. And be encouraged by Hebrews, don't give up coming. Continue meeting together. Let's encourage each other, let's rebuke one another when we need to, but let's live life together. Let's experience God together. If we need to, we can experience VR together as a church here. Go look at the ark, it's pretty cool. But do it together physically. Don't do it in the metaverse. It has its place, yes. But that's not Christianity. That's not what we're called to do. We're not called to be e-Christians. We're called to be Christians, followers of Christ, disciples. And we're called to be those things together. So let's carry on meeting together. Let's carry on building up one another more and more as we see the day of the Lord approaching and as we see the end coming. Let's not give in to what the world wants, the convenient version of Christianity. Instead, let's stick to what we should be doing, meeting together, praising God, and living the way that we should be living, not just on our WhatsApp statuses. All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that... Being one of your children is such a unique experience, Lord. The world is definitely trying to modernize that with VR churches, VR experiences, online churches, Lord. But we know that that's not what we're called to, Lord. Those are a tool to supplement your kingdom um, and a tool to supplement your word, Father, given at a church, your building, your people. So, Lord, we just thank you this morning that we can come together as your people, Lord. We can come together physically in real life to experience you together, Lord, to share walking with you, to share our experiences of being your child. 
Lord, we pray that as time goes on and Lord, as e-Christianity and virtual church and um, online church gains more traction around the world, Lord, we pray that you will keep us steadfast in you, Father, steadfast in what it is we're actually supposed to be doing, Lord, that we may not post one thing online but live out something else entirely, that we may not post one thing, Lord, but not actually be walking with you, but instead, Lord, we'll be drawn closer to you, Father, because we know where our true, um, our true source is, Lord, and it's you. It's not an online YouTube channel. Father, we just thank you for your teachings, Lord. We thank you for the example of the church in Acts, Lord. Um, we thank you, Father, for your teachings on Timothy. And we just thank you, Lord, that you tell us clearly, Lord, that we shouldn't just act out something, but not let it change us. But instead, we should let your Holy Spirit change us, Lord, so we can walk with you the way you have intended. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.